our last lesson we talked at great length how the peasants the tribals were responding to Gandhi's call for boycotting everything foreign everything British they were interpreting the non-cooperation movement and Gandhi's ideals in their own ways and they often resorted to violence they did not really follow the Gandhian ideal of non-violence. In this lesson, we will be focusing on the course that this non-cooperation movement followed over the years. What we begin with is a discussion on labor unrest. So it were not just the peasants and tribals who were suppressed and exploited by the colonizers, by the local landowners. Laborers in different parts of the subcontinent were also exploited by the colonial rule in different kinds of ways. New kinds of impositions made their lives very, very difficult. In this regard, let us now travel to the Indian state of Assam and see how the laborers were in a state of unrest and agitation in this region during the colonial period immediately after the non-cooperation movement was launched. Assam is a leading producer of tea and it continues to remain so even today. There are many tea plantations where the laborers and the workers used to work during the colonial period and they do so even today. Now the workers and the laborers who worked at these tea plantations in colonial period depended on their mobility. That is to say, they heavily relied on their freedom to enter and exit the plantations whenever they wanted. In fact, many of these plantation workers often went back to their homes and meet their families. But when the Inland Immigration Act of 1859 was imposed, the workers were no longer free to go back to their homes or even leave the plantations whenever they wished. For this, the workers had to seek the permission from the colonial officials at the plantations. And it is understandable that the colonial officials did not give permissions to these workers to leave the tea plantations. As a result of this, the workers were filled with hatred and anger. How long could they continue working without any rest, without even meeting their families? So it was this Inland Immigration Act of 1859 that posed a severe threat to these workers' mobility. But the workers were inspired by Gandhi's idea of boycotting the British goods, boycotting British institutions, British establishments. And so they now started leaving the plantations and going back home. Now why do you think did they begin to do so? These people were also holding on to the idea that Gandhi Raj would begin in the Indian subcontinent soon. And so they started going back to their own villages where they thought Gandhi would give them lands. But it was not to happen this way. And unfortunately enough, these workers were caught by the police. Because these workers could not escape the plantations as they had wished for. And instead they were caught by the police and brutally beaten up. So these plantation workers dreams of achieving Gandhiraj and living peacefully in their villages were completely shattered by the colonial officers and the police in duty. In our last lesson, we learned how different groups of tribals, peasants in different parts of the Indian subcontinent were straying away from Gandhi's ideals. They were organizing their own movements to address their local and immediate needs, to address local and colonial oppression, but their movements were more often than not, not in line with the Gandhian ideal, not in line with what the Congress leadership proposed. 
Now, despite acting against the terms of the Congress and resorting to violence in many cases, the peasants and laborers were emotionally relating to a nationalist spirit simply by evoking the name of Gandhi. So, it was this one name of Gandhi that filled them with a spirit of nationalism. They were thinking that they were following Gandhi's ideals and in this way, Gandhi would bring them independence from colonial rule. Gandhi was hailed and revered as their messiah and it was Gandhi who could unify these people at an emotional level, at the psychological level. But the Britishers were very severe and brutal with their response to these tribal movements, to these peasant rebellions, to these labor unrests. Because these people were actually threatening the stability of the colonial government in the subcontinent. And the Britishers could not let this happen. They had to retain their power and for this they resorted to violence and brutality in most of the cases. And so the British now started banning public meetings because in these public meetings the masses gathered to organize their movements and to decide on the course of action that they were to follow. So all kinds of public meetings demonstrations were banned by the Britishers and this was not all. Press was also shut down because press played a very crucial role in spreading the news of these local movements or even the larger and the national non-cooperation movement throughout the subcontinent. And this in turn was uniting the people. This in turn was holding the people on a common ground. And so press had to be shut down by the Britishers in order to retain their stronghold on the colonized people. In fact, during this time, most of these nationalist leaders who were organizing their movements, who were leading protests were arrested and even many were executed. As many as 30,000 Congress leaders and volunteers were imprisoned. So this is how the British government in India was severely and brutally and repressively responding to the protests and demonstrations that were breaking out in several parts of the subcontinent. As circumstances would have it, the non-cooperation movement came to an end only for a small incident that took a violent turn. Now in a place called Chauri Chora that is located in Bihar, in February 1922, a group of agitators had gathered together and the police began to beat them up. Because of this Lathi charge, many of these agitators were severely injured. They were angered and infuriated and this infuriated mob took a very violent shape and they set a police station on fire and they burnt alive 22 policemen. Now, this was a very violent thing to happen in Chaurichara. When this news reached Gandhi, he decided to call off the non-cooperation movement. Because he realized that if the masses could no longer remain non-violent, then there was no point in continuing the non-cooperation movement. At the very foundation of the non-cooperation movement was this idea of non-violence that people in several parts of the subcontinent were not following, were straying away from. So the non-cooperation movement wasn't taking people any further towards the way of achieving freedom and independence and so it was in February 1922 that Gandhi called off the non-cooperation movement because of this Chauri Chaura incident. Before proceeding with this lesson, let me ask you a question. When did Gandhi call off the non-cooperation movement? Did he call off this movement in 1920, 1922, 1919 or in 1921? Well, the correct answer is 1922. Following an agitation outside a police station in Chauri Chaura in February 1922, the masses became very violent. 
and they killed 22 policemen and they set a police station on fire. Gandhi saw that the masses were resorting to violence and there was no point in continuing the non-cooperation movement which is why he called off this national movement in the year 1922. Now the British government saw a threat in the person of Gandhi. They believed that Gandhi was actually arousing feelings of hatred in the minds of the Indians against the Britishers. And so in March 1922, Gandhi was sentenced to six years of imprisonment. This also angered the masses a lot because they hailed and revered Gandhi as their national leader, as their hero, as their messiah. But because of how the events were turning out, Gandhi was imprisoned in March 1922. Now, after the non-cooperation movement was called off, the Muslim League and the Indian National Congress started parting ways. Because it was this non-cooperation movement that had brought together the Muslim League and the Indian National Congress. Because when the Indian National Congress supported the Khilafat movement, the Muslims agreed to join this national movement. And the Hindus were already a part of it, which is why it was possible to achieve a Hindu-Muslim united movement in the form of the national movement, which was the non-cooperation movement. But after this movement was called off, the Hindus and the Muslims or the Indian National Congress and the Muslim League parted their ways. In fact, divisions also started surfacing within the Congress itself. Now let us learn about how different groups of people within the Congress held their opinions. Now there were two groups of people and their response to change was very distinctly different. First we come to the pro-changes. People in the likes of C. R. Das or Motilal Nehru believed that change was required and so the Congress should be a part of the legislation. And if the Congress started contesting in the elections and could gain a majority, they would be able to stop or hinder the Britishers from the passing of any anti-Indian laws. So in this way, people like C. R. Das or Motilal Nehru wanted to bring about changes by participating in the legislative elections. So these people who wanted changes in the system of governance now participated in the elections for the provincial and central legislatures in 1923. And when they did so, they won a large number of seats. And in this way, they wanted to ensure that the Britishers could not pass any anti-Indian laws because they were holding the majority in the legislative processes. These pro-changes demanded provincial autonomy because they did not want to remain subjugated to or dependent on the colonial rule. Instead, they demanded provincial autonomy. As opposed to the pro-changes were the no-changes. Now, these people did not believe or support entering the legislative process. Instead, these people were wanting to distance themselves from the Britishers as much as possible and they focused on constructive programs in the likes of promotion of Khadi, fostering Hindu-Muslim unity and removal of untouchability. Now, in the No Changes group, we have people like C. Raja Gopalachari or even Rajendra Prasad. So, these people were not in line with the ideas of the pro-changers. Now, there were many people in the Congress, the youths to be specific, like Jawaharlal Nehru or Shubhas Chandra Bose who demanded complete independence. So, they were in favor or in demand for Swaraj. They did not demand provincial autonomy what they wanted is complete independence, complete autonomy from colonial rule. 
with this we come to an end of our discussion on how the non cooperation movement was revoked in 1922 following the chauri chaura incident because gandhi saw that many agitators many protesters were not following his path of non violence which is why there was no point in continuing the non cooperation movement now after this non cooperation movement was called off divisions started surfacing within the congress and among the hindus and the muslims between the indian national congress and the muslim league we learnt about the pro changers who wanted to enter the legislative process and maintain their dominion within that and on the other hand there were the no changers who believed that they should completely distance themselves from the Britishers and instead focus on using indigenous products, focus on certain constructive programs. And last but not the least, we also talked about how people like Jawaharlal Nehru or Shubhas Chandra Bose demanded complete independence from colonial rule. Having learnt about these groups of people, in a subsequent lesson we will be focusing on another group of people who had a very radically different opinion and response to this Indian national movement. They wanted to gain independence from the colonizers in a very different kind of way. So, in a subsequent lesson we will be finding out about that group of people who were very much a part of this Indian national movement. Don't forget to subscribe to our channel and hit the bell icon. You can also register for free at deltastep.com or download the Delta Step app to learn one to one with our amazing teachers or to get access to all our 5000 plus amazing videos as per your school syllabus. Master each topic with our adaptive practice technology. Get million plus questions with step by step solutions and unlimited mock tests. Get all your doubts resolved instantly. Learn via games and win amazing prizes like playstations and iPads. So at Delta Step, learning is not just fun and easy, it's rewarding too. So register for free now.